Good day, grade 10s. So today we're going to start with environmental studies. So if you remember from grade 8, the environment include all of the living things in an area, like the plants, the animals, and the microorganisms, as well as the non-living things. So like the air, the water, and the soil. And in this topic, we are going to look at how all of these things interact with each other. Okay, to start off with, we are just going to highlight some terminology that we will be using throughout this unit uh, and just clarifying some concepts that are oftentimes confused by learners. So firstly, ecology is the study of interactions between living organisms and their environment. Okay, so this is really what I spoke about when I introduced the topic. Um, and this is a field of study uh, where you look at maybe a group of organisms, a species, and how it would interact with other species, and also how it interacts and is dependent on the non-living things in the environment. Okay, so it's a field of study. Then the ecosystem is the whole area um, and looking at all of the living things and non-living things in an area. And then we refer to that as an ecosystem. Whereas the environment is similar to the ecosystem, but this is where you kind of focus on an individual organism or a group of organism, uh, organisms and you look at everything around it. So everything around an organism that affects its survival. Okay, so uh, ecosystem and environment is sometimes used interchangeably, but that is actually incorrect. Okay, so make sure you understand the difference between the two. Then the biosphere is a thin layer of land, air and water that supports life. Okay, but we're going to talk about the biosphere now in a second. And then biomes, which we'll also get onto, is a group of ecosystems with a similar climate and communities of plants and animals. Okay, so um, I'll use this example again in the future, but for example, you have forests uh, that is very similar in their climate, the types of plants and animals that, that they have. Um, and you have forests in South Africa, you have forests in South America, for, uh, forests in Asia. Um, and they have similar characteristics, however, they are different in other ways. Um, but we refer to that then as a forest biome. Okay, but we'll get more into it when we discuss biomes. Okay, so more terminology that I just want to uh, bring to your attention. Uh, this is uh, terminology that we discussed in grade 8, but you should again be aware of it. Um, so when we look at an individual organism, so one organism, then that is just an individual. When you also look at other members of that organism species um, in an area, then we call that a population. Okay, so let's say these are goldfish, then this is a, uh, a population of goldfish within a pond. Okay, and then if you put uh, that organism or that species uh, with a bunch of other species uh, in the pond, then that refers, uh, we refer to that as the community of organisms within, um, let's say, the pond. And then if you add in the non-living things, so the water and the rocks, uh, then that is the ecosystem. So the ecosystem is all of the living things and non-living things in an area. And then the biome, yeah, what we discussed earlier, uh, is when you have similar ecosystems Okay, but they are separated from each other. So I, I know in this picture it's not really that separated, but so these are similar ecosystems um, that are separated from each other. And then the biosphere is just everything, um, every, every, everywhere on earth where life exists. Okay, so now we can have a look at the biosphere uh, as an individual topic. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but let's look at it. Okay, so another definition for the biosphere is everywhere on Earth where life exists. Okay, so earlier we said it's a thin layer of land, air, and water that supports life. Or we can just turn it around and we can say it's everywhere on Earth where life exists. Okay, it can also be described as the sum of all of the ecosystems on Earth. Okay, and as we mentioned, uh, the biosphere uh, is the thin layer of land, okay, water, and air where life exists. Another way to describe this is to refer to it as the atmosphere, the lithosphere, and the hydrosphere. 
Okay, now normally we would go a bit more in depth on all three of these, uh, but that has been removed for this year, so you should just be aware uh, that uh, the biosphere consists of these three uh, spheres. Then we get to biomes. Okay, so this is actually the, the main topic that we will be discussing in this video. So we said earlier that a biome is, uh, or biomes are groups of ecosystems with similar characteristics. But a more descriptive definition uh, would be to say that a biome is a particular physical environment with a specific climate, plants, and animals. Okay, so what does this mean? So if we look at the climate aspect of it, then the climate refers to the amount of rainfall and the average um, and range of temperatures that is found in the ecosystem. Okay, so then the climate is going to affect the plants that can grow there. Okay, and we also refer to the plants as the flora. So the flora uh, is plants adapted to survive in the specific climatic conditions of the ecosystem. Okay, and then the plants is obviously also going to influence the animals. Okay, and we refer to the animals as the fauna. Okay, so because the animals obviously have to eat the plants. So depending on the type of plants will determine what type of fauna we find in the biome. Okay, so the types of plants will determine the type of animals in the biome. So then we're going to look at the nine terrestrial biomes found in South Africa. Okay, so terrestrial biomes refers to the biomes on land. We're also later going to look at the aquatic biomes. But for now, we're just going to look at the terrestrial biomes. So these are the nine terrestrial biomes of South Africa. And you can see here the map of where they are found. Uh, and as we go through them, you should indicate on the map in your notes um, where each biome is found. So there's a key. Um, so you can either use colors or numbers, whatever works for you. But you must indicate as we go through each biome where it is found on the map. Then you also have this table uh, with all of the terrestrial biomes in the table. And it is a nice summary of everything. So you just have to, uh, for each biome, you just have to know where it is found, uh, the type of climate in the summer and in the winter, and also the types of plants or flora and the types of animals or fauna. Okay, so as we go through the, uh, each biome, just indicate this information in this table as well as indicating on the map where it is found. So the first bi biome that we're going to be looking at is the Feinbos biome. Okay, and that's actually the biome that we live in here in the Western Cape. So it is found in the southwestern parts of South Africa. So if you look here at the map, then you see, okay, that's basically the Western Cape, large parts of the Western Cape. The type of climate we have in the Feinbos biome is uh, hot and dry during the summers and cool and wet during the winters. Okay, so this should be familiar to you as this is basically uh, the seasons that we have here in the Western Cape. And then based on this climate, uh, we have a very specific type of plants that grow in the area. And the plants that grow here is collectively referred to as, the, as feinbos. And feinbos is actually unique to South Africa as it isn't found anywhere else in the world. So two examples of feinbos is the proteas and the restios. Okay, we only highlight these two, uh, but there's obviously way more examples. Uh, and you actually only have to write down uh, the one that is highlighted in your table. So you only have to write down proteas. So hopefully you know what a protea looks like, but over here is a picture. Okay, and then this over here is an example or is restio. Okay, so it's these long, thin, reed-like structures. And then the types of animals that live here, based on the plants that grow here, um, is, or two examples, is the sugar bird. Okay, so the sugar bird you see over here, um, and it has this long beak. Uh, well, not extremely long, but longer than normal. Uh, and it helps uh, the sugar bird to get into the, uh, the uh, very tough uh, leathery leaves of the feinbos. Uh, and get to the nectar, um, as well as the Cape Cobra, okay, which hopefully you haven't come across one of those in the wild, uh, but it is um, unique to the Feinbos biome. 
Then the second type of biome is the forest biome. Uh, now, we don't have many forests left in South Africa, uh, as a lot of them have been cut down for the trees, uh, but there is still a few left. If you have a look here on the map, you see all of these black dots, uh, and that is uh, typically uh, forest biomes, so usually quite high altitude areas, uh, but not always. Um, and, uh, but it's very difficult to indicate this on your map. So you only have to indicate this small part over here, which is a large stretch of forest uh, found along the garden root area. Uh, if you go there to George and Wilderness area, uh, then that's where you will still find some uh, forest areas. Uh, so the location, small patches, normally at high altitudes in South Africa. The type of climate we see there is warm, humid with high rainfall in the summers and mild, humid and high rainfall in the winters. So typically it has high rainfall throughout the year and this influences the type of plants that grow there. Now again, there's a large uh, variety of plants that grow in forests. Um, like all of these tall trees is very characteristic of forests uh, but two uh, that oftentimes go overlooked is uh, moss and ferns that grow underneath the canopy of the trees okay, and that's because these two plants can grow with less sun because the canopy of the trees blocks out the sun uh, and that makes it a, a fertile ground for uh, moss and ferns especially also because it has so much rainfall Okay, and then the type of animals that live here, again, based on the, uh, the plant growth is, or the two examples that we're going to look at is the leopard and the bushbuck. Okay, so over here you see the uh, bushbuck and then the leopard. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them um, have been killed off, uh, but it is uh, characteristic of the forest biomes is the leopard. So then we get on to another one of South Africa's iconic uh, biomes, not the most exciting one, but it still uh, typifies a large part of South Africa. Um, and as you can see, uh, there's not a lot going on there, uh, and that should give you an idea to why we call it the grassland biome. Uh, but it is, not, or it is found in the central part of South Africa, so a very large part of South Africa uh, is typified by the grassland biome. Okay, so found in Central South Africa, and then the climate we find there in the summers, it is cool and wet, and in the winters it is cold and dry. Okay, so this is uh, one that learners oftentimes get wrong, because uh, it is not very intuitive, uh, especially for us living in the Western Cape. Uh, we're not used to uh, seeing dry linked with winters, and we're not used to seeing cool linked with summers. Okay, so make sure that you note this. And then based on that, uh, or based on the climate, um, we see uh, that the plants in the area, there isn't a wide variety of plants that grow in the area. Uh, it is mostly grass, okay, so tall grass, and the occasional tree. Okay, so, but the main characteristic of the grassland is obviously the tall grass. And then based on this, we can guess that this, uh, area must be very good for a lot of herbivores okay because they they have a lot of food to eat okay which is indeed the case so we the animals we find in the area okay is a lot of large herbivores for example the black wildebeest and the blessed book okay but again only write down the ones that are highlighted in red then that brings us to probably south africa's most iconic biome uh, especially if you were to ask foreigners uh, the savanna biome. So this is normally what people think of when they think of South Africa uh, because this is what is advertised to them uh, from tourist companies uh, abroad uh, to come to South Africa. So over here you see the acacia tree and behind it the sunset and over here you see the elephant eating from the marula tree. Okay, so this is very iconic uh, of this biome. Uh, so where do we find this? Because obviously this is not what we are used to here in the Western Cape. Uh, this is very much found along the northern border of South Africa as well as along a bit along the east coast. Okay, so it's a found, a found along the northeastern parts of South Africa. The type of climate in the area is hot and humid. Uh, so humid, uh, humidity, remember, refers to uh, the amount of water vapor in the air. 
Okay, so because it is very hot, a lot of the water evaporates and it makes the air humid. Uh, this is during the summer and then during the winter, the, uh, the climate is warm and dry. As a result of this, the type of plants in the area, uh, or at least some of the uh, plant growth in the area, uh, we see the marula tree, which is this one over here, and the acacia tree, which is this one over here, which has that large canopy. Okay, and then uh, some of the animals, obviously this uh, area is very iconic for the, all of the big five, uh, but just two uh, highlighted here is the elef elephant and the rhino. Okay, and this one is actually nice and easy to remember. So you just think of the Amarula advert. So the plant growth is the Marula tree and the animal found in the area is the elephant. Then we get the thicket biome. Uh, so some of you might have come across this if you've ever gone uh, on holiday along the south coast of South Africa and you look out the window as you drive along the N2, uh, then some parts here the, along the south coast you would see this thicket biome that is characterized by this very densely packed uh, plants growing uh, uh, in between each other and intertwining uh, leaves and uh, branches. Um, that gives it its name, the thicket biome. Okay, so the areas, as we mentioned, is the coastal areas along the southeastern parts of South Africa. The climate we find here is warm and humid during the summer and then just mild during the winter. So the, the weather is actually in a lot of parts along the south coast is actually very comfortable and a lot of people uh, go and retire there because of the uh, nice weathered, um, especially during the winter, it doesn't get too cold. Um, so, so yeah, the, the climate here is, is very stable and livable uh, most parts of the year. As a result of that, we see all of this plant growth uh, in the area. Um, and the two that we highlight here is the aloe uh, and the grass. Uh, so aloe, you have many different types of aloe. So over here, you see some that grow a bit higher above the ground. Uh, you also have ones that grow lower to the ground. So it's very characteristic of the area. Uh, and a lot of the aloe vera products are actually made in this area of South Africa. And then the animals in the area. So the two highlighted here is the rhino and the kudu. Um, so you can imagine, uh, if you look here at this, uh, the vegetation in the area, that it's quite difficult for large animals to live in this area because of the thick bushes. Um, they, they would have a difficult time getting through here. So a lot of the animals are actually smaller animals that can get in between the branches. Uh, but two animals that can live here um, is the rhino and the kudu. Okay, so if we highlight the rhino here, then you can imagine uh, this thick bush is no match for the uh, strength of the rhino. The rhino with its thick leathery skin um, and its horn, okay, it can just make its own way through the, uh, the thicket. Um, so it doesn't really pose a problem for the rhino. Okay, so that's one way to easily remember these connections. Then we get the Namakarua biome. So again, some of you might be familiar with this biome if you've ever gone uh, on holiday to um, like Otsuring and the surrounding areas. Uh, so the area we refer to as the Central Plateau of the Western and Northern Capes. Um, and uh, you can see that over here. Okay, so central part of South Africa, just a bit lower down from where we found the grassland biome. Uh, and the climate in the area is very hot and very dry during the summer. Okay, and in the winter, it is still dry, but it actually gets quite cold. So you see these, um, these extremes of temperature between the summer and winter months. Then, as you can imagine, based on the climate, the plant growth in the area is fairly sparse. Uh, so we don't see a lot of plant growth. But what we do see growing there is some succulents. And we're going to refer to succulents quite often in uh, some of the other biomes as well. Uh, so succulents are plants that can hold a lot of water. Uh, they have thick leaves um, to store the water and not lose too much water through transpiration. We also see some acacia trees and shrubs quite low to the ground, as you see in this picture. The animals in the area, so two examples is tortoises and termites. 
Okay, so you can see here the tortoise uh, walking on uh, dead grass, uh, looking for some succulents to uh, eat and get nutrients from. Then we get the succulent karua. Okay, so this don't confuse this with the nama karua. Um, so there is some similarities, but the succulent karua is found along the western coast of South Africa. Okay, and due to this, due to it being along the coast, um, it has a bit more going for it. Okay, so, so yes, the, the climate is still hot and dry in the summer and cold and dry in the winter. Okay, so there's still very low rainfall, but due to the fact that it is along the coast, uh, there's more moisture in the air from the breezes coming in from the ocean, uh, which does uh, provide a bit more moisture for plants to grow. So we do see a bit more variety in plants, um, and this is also where it gets its name, because a lot of the plants in the area are succulent plants. Now this can be a bit confusing uh, with the Namakarua, because we also said that in the Namakarua there's succulents, okay, but in the succulent Karua there's a lot more succulent plants. One of these uh, succulent plants is Feigis, which is a very popular plant even here in the Western Cape. A lot of people plant it in their gardens because it doesn't require a lot of care uh, and it is uh, quite, uh, can be quite attractive and you do get them in different colors. Uh, so Feigis are very common in this area, uh, but it's also been brought to other parts of South Africa. And then again, we also see the tree aloe, uh, which you can actually nicely see over here. Uh, and then the animals in the area is, uh, or two examples, is the bat-eared fox, okay, which is pictured over here, and the barking gecko, which is pictured over here. Then the last terrestrial biome that we're going to be looking at is the desert biome. Now, South Africa doesn't have a very large desert, um, so parts of the uh, Namakarua and Succulent Karua you might think is desert-like, uh, but a desert um, has a lot lower rainfall, um, so you see a lot less plant growth. Uh, now, we don't have a large part of South Africa that is classified as desert. It's only uh, um, along our border with Namibia uh, and along the Orange River where we do see a bit of um, a desert biome. Uh, but it more extends into Namibia where you see, obviously, the, Nam Namib, desert, the Namib Desert. Um, uh, that is, has a lot more uh, desert-like characteristics. But we do have the small part, so we'll talk about that. So it's found along the northwestern part of South Africa, and then also obviously Namibia. Uh, the climate in the area is very hot and dry uh, in the summer, and cold and dry in the winter. And then the animals and uh, the plants in the area, uh, or examples of plants in the area, is the kookerboom, which you see over here. So a very a uh, distinct looking tree, um, and then also some succulents. And then the animals in the area, so quite unique for uh, desert, um, is the uh, gemsbok, okay, which is a very large antelope, uh, and it's unique for such a large herbivore to, um, to be found in a desert-like environment. Okay, but they are um, uh, indigenous to, to these areas. Um, so, yeah, quite interesting. And then also another example is the desert rat. So that is then all of the terrestrial biomes uh, of South Africa. So your table should now be filled out. So everything, every block should be filled in. Uh, and this is a very nice summary of all of the terrestrial biomes in South Africa. That then brings us to the aquatic biomes of South Africa. Uh, so found in and around South Africa. Now we're not going to spend a lot of time here. Uh, we're just going to mention the different types of aquatic biomes and then we're going to look at one aspect of aquatic biomes. Uh, but you should go read uh, page 141 to 143 for some more information about aquatic biomes. So aquatic biomes can be divided into three parts. You have your inland freshwater biomes your coastal biomes and your marine biomes. Okay, so inland freshwater refers to any landlocked area of water. Uh, so that would be rivers, lakes, uh, and wetlands that we're going to discuss now on the next slide. And then coastal biomes is uh, the ocean, but found along 
the coast. So coastlines, beaches, rocky shores, okay, that's examples of coastal biomes. So you see over here, uh, that's a coral reef found along uh, the shoreline. And then the marine biome is deep ocean, so open ocean. So as you go further from the shore, then you go into the marine biomes. But then, like I said, we're going to focus more on wetlands because that's quite important as we move forward um, in grade 11 and grade 12. Um, so wetlands are inland freshwater biomes. Um, so it, uh, it is a any area uh, that is covered by water for at least part of the year. Okay, so that includes lakes, ponds, marshes, dams, swamps, uh, etc. So basically any area where there's water for some part of the year. And then what we really want to focus on here is why uh, wetlands are important. Okay, because our wetlands are decreasing um, as we are uh, urbanizing and building more. Uh, a, a lot of wetlands are just being destroyed. So it is important just to note what functions do wetlands serve uh, in the environment. So uh, firstly, it slows down floodwaters. So this is one that oftentimes confuses people. Uh, like we don't have a lot of floods, so why is this important? Okay, but one of the reasons we don't have a lot of floods is because wetlands stop wa uh, water from building up speed and momentum and creating floods. Okay, so uh, wetlands very important for uh, for catching water and then stopping floods from uh, even starting. Uh, then also due to water not being able to move quite as fast, we see. Uh, reduced soil erosion. Um, wetlands also filter water. So uh, you see this example over here where there's a lot of plant growth in the wetland. Okay, and all of that plant growth helps to filter out and improve the quality of the water. It also traps sediment and nutrients, okay, which is important for um, the other living things in the area. Uh, so for the plants to grow and the plants is then important for the animals, um, so very important. And then it also provides a breeding ground for certain animals. Okay, so that is then the end of um, our section on biomes. Uh, so next up, we're looking at ecosystems. So ecosystems are areas where living organisms interact with other living organisms as well as with non, the non-living environment. Okay, so um, any area can really be defined as an ecosystem. Okay, so you can, uh, you can look at this pond and say that is an ecosystem. Okay, and then you look at all of the living things inside of the pond as well as the non-living things uh, and how it interacts with each other. Or you can say, no, I want to look at this whole area with the, um, the land included and look at that as an ecosystem, okay? Uh, or you can look at a whole um, uh, national park as an ecosystem, okay? Or you can even just look at one human being as an ecosystem. Because yes, on your body, there is billions of microorganisms crawling around inside and outside on your body. Um, so that can be seen as an ecosystem, okay? So an ecosystem isn't really defined by its size. Uh, it's just defined by how you want to study it, okay? And we do that by looking at all of the living and non-living things in the ecosystem. We call those living and non-living things, okay, biotic and abiotic factors. So abiotic factors is all of the non-living factors that influences the environment. For example, the climate and the soil uh, is non-living things. And then biotic factors are all of the uh, all of the factors that arise from activities of living organisms. Okay, so that seems complicated, uh, but basically it just means how uh, living things interact with each other. Uh, so for example, predation when they eat each other, competition when they compete for resources uh, is examples of living factors. Okay, so things that living things do that affect other living things. So we are then very briefly going to look at some of the biotic and abiotic factors, starting with the abiotic factors. 
So the abiotic factors can be broadly classified into three categories. Now normally we would spend a lot of time examining each of these three categories and you should go look at um, what falls under each of these uh, on these pages uh, but I'm just going to make you aware of what are the three categories. So firstly we have the uh, physiographic factors uh, which is basically referring to all of the uh, physical geography of the area. So whether or not it is a mountainous area, um, how steep the slope is, um, what, uh, how it is orientated towards the sun, um, etc. So the physical geography of the area. Then we have the edaphic factors, which refers to the soil okay, and conditions of the soil. So this is um, uh, the, the project that you did in term one uh, was based on uh, from this content. Okay, so normally we do spend a lot of time here, uh, but now we're just making you aware of what is edaphic factors. And then the last one and the simplest one is the climatic factors. Okay, so that is the temperature and the rainfall uh, that we find in an area. Then we are going to look a bit more at the biotic factors, uh, but again, there's been a lot that has been reduced, uh, but we are going to look at some of them. So we said that biotic factors are factors that arise from interactions between living organisms. Okay, and these interactions can be divided into five uh, types. So firstly, we have predation, which is where predators hunt and kills their prey. Then we have competition, where uh, organisms compete for the same limited resource. So an example you see here, the zebras and the wildebeest okay, are competing over this limited supply of water. Then mutualism is uh, interactions between different species where both individuals benefit from the interaction. So over here you see a crocodile and a, um, and a bird, and this bird is actually eating the scraps from between the teeth of the crocodile. Okay, so the crocodile gets its teeth cleaned uh, and prevents infection while the bird gets a free meal. Then commensalism is interactions between different species where one benefits and the other is unaffected. So example here where you see the shark and the fish swimming around it. Uh, the shark will kill its prey and then these fish will eat the scraps uh, left over or that falls off uh, as the shark is eating. Uh, so the shark doesn't really, uh, isn't really harmed through this interaction while the fish gets a uh, free meal, okay, so it benefits. Then the last one is parasitism and these are interactions where one organism benefits uh, and the other one is actively harmed. Okay, so the one that uh, benefits is called the parasite uh, and the one that is harmed is called the host. So example is when you get a tick that latches onto you, um, then that tick gets nutrients from sucking your blood. Okay, while it can actually be very dangerous for you and you can get diseases from uh, tick bites, uh, so that is how it will eventually harm or could harm you as the host. Okay, or animals often also get tick bites. Okay, and it can be harmful to them. Then next we're going to look at feeding relationships. Um, so this is specifically uh, where we looked at predation. Uh, this is now more focusing in on uh, different types of feeding relationships. Okay, but this whole section is self-study, but it is very important. Okay, the only reason why it is self-study is because uh, you've done this in grade 8. Okay, so the, uh, these concepts are familiar to you. Okay, so I'm very quickly going to run through it. Okay, but you should still study this. This is in your notes. Okay, so make sure that you underline um, what is underlined here and that you study this um, for the tests and exams. Okay, so feeding relationships uh, refer to um, how we classify different uh, parts of the food chain, basically. Okay, so if you remember from grade 8, uh, we start each food chain with producers. Okay, now in grade 10, we always have fancy words for certain things. Okay, and in this case, we refer to producers as autotrophs. Okay, so examples here are plants, 
that produce food for animals during photosynthesis um, using inorganic substances uh, in the presence of sunlight and chlorophyll. Okay, so basically autotrophs or producers produce the food for the rest of the food chain. Then consumers or heterotrophs okay, are organisms that rely on producers and other consumers for energy. So these are okay, organisms uh, further along the food chain. Uh, you then get primary consumers, secondary consumers and tertiary consumers. Okay, and then lastly, at the end of the food chain, you have decomposers, okay, or saprophytes. And these are organisms that feed on the dead remains of other organisms in the food chain. Okay, so feed on dead organic matter. And apart from that, they are also very important in ecosystems uh, because they break down this organic matter and return some of that valuable nutrients uh, to the soil. Examples um, of organisms that do this is fungi and bacteria. And here's just a, a nutrient cycle, but we will look at this later, okay, of how nutrients are cycled through uh, the ecosystem. Okay, and then uh, how we put all of this together is we either put it into a food chain or a food web. Okay, and again, we did this in grade 8, um, so we're not going to go over it, uh, but you should be able to analyze food chains and food webs. Okay, and it basically just shows how energy moves uh, from one organism to the next. Um, so a food chain, you only look at a linear path. Okay, whereas for a food web, you look at overlapping food chains, okay, so a bunch of organisms, okay, and how they all interact with each other. Okay, something that is important here um, is just to know that the arrow always shows the direction that the energy moves. Okay, so um, you have the producers, um, and the energy will then move from the producer to the herbivore or primary consumer. Okay, so the arrow indicates the direction that the energy moves. Okay, I'm going to end the video here, uh, and then in the next video we will look at what I just spoke about, okay, the flow of energy in ecosystems. Okay, but for, we'll end this video here and we'll do this in the next video.